All right. Welcome back to the design and architecture track here at API Days. I'm Tony Blank. I head up the Twilio Startups team. And I have some really exciting news. We are a scant three hours and 40 minutes away from cocktail hour. So, yeah. But, uh, oh, there, yeah, applause is appropriate. That's great. All right. But first, please put your hands together for Leaf, who's going to be talking about deployment patterns for API gateways. Take it away. Thank you so much. Hello, everybody. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for braving it through strikes and cold and everything to uh, share this moment with us here today. Uh, it's, uh, it's been a long day already, I'm sure. I'm going to try not to harm you permanently during this. So my name is Leif Beaton. I work as a solutions architect for Nginx. I've been with the company for about three years now, which bizarrely makes me a veteran. Um, that's, I suppose, the virtue of uh, going through the whole startup procedure and ultimately getting married to a bigger brother in the industry. Uh, as I'm sure many of you are aware, Nginx was uh, recently acquired by F5 Networks. Uh, that went through in May, and we're, uh, we're still on our honeymoon, but we're, we're still very much in love. So, let me start with a brief bit of history. So, number of web servers on the internet from 1991 to today. Uh, some of these numbers may have to be taken with a grain of salt. Uh, our measuring techniques weren't quite as, uh, as polished back in the day as they are today. But as, as I'm sure you can agree, there's been, a, there's been an increase from 1 to, well, 1.7 billion. Uh, the number I want to highlight here uh, in, uh, in terms of Nginx is 2001. In 2001, the original Nginx open source project uh, saw its first line of code. It wasn't released quite in 2001. Uh, I believe it was in early to mid-2004 it was released. But the reason for Nginx coming to in, into existence is perhaps more interesting than when. Uh, our uh, founder, uh, chief genius and uh, all-around good guy, Igor Sosoyev, he was working uh, in, uh, in Russia for a company that was experiencing the same problem as the entire industry was seeing at the time. It was such a big problem, it was uh, given a term. It was called the C10K problem. Uh, it was essentially uh, the issue of having 10,000 concurrent connections per server or more. It was one of them bizarre problems that you couldn't solve with money. Uh, it was the architecture of the day, the web servers in existence couldn't cope with it, so it became a scaling nightmare. Igor, of course, being Russian, thought to himself, well, I can do better. So he went into the basement with some pizza and coke, I presume, and he started developing what became Nginx. Uh, Nginx, when it was released in uh, 2004, saw exponential growth because uh, Igor's desire was as many as possible should be able to use this because the entire industry was faced with one and the same problem and there was only one solution. So he open sourced it to his credit. Fast forward to today. That's this year. Uh, we overtook Apache as the prevalent web server globally in, uh, in uh, I think it was March or April this year. Uh, that's not a big surprise to anybody familiar with Nginx and the exponential growth we've had. Now, out of interest, could I see a raise of hands? How many of you have heard of Nginx prior to today? <laughs> I love this. <laughs> this is why I love my job. Uh, now, next question. How many of you are using Nginx in some shape or form today? Wow. Well, that's pretty representative of the numbers we're seeing here. Now, every year we do a customer survey, uh, surveying both our open source community members as well as our uh, enterprise customers. And we were slightly surprised by finding this. The reason it was slightly surprising is Nginx was never developed ex explicitly to be an API gateway. That being said, we live and breathe HTTP, so we function really, really well there. As a matter of fact, there's a number of third-party companies that's basing their API management suite on Nginx as the data plane, as the actual API gateway. So uh, I think it's reasonably safe to say we're the de facto standard when it comes to gateway functionality. 
Anyways, so gateway is one out of two words that are often used interchangeably, sometimes mixed up. And we're talking gateway versus management. Just to specify which is what, API management is where you deal with policy management, with analytics, um, visibility into what's going on in your organization. If something breaks, you need to know where and why and how. And when is usually helpful as well, as, uh, as well as the documentation bit and your, uh, your developer portal and, and those sorts of good stuff. That's what lands on the side of API management. The API gateway, however, is what enforces these policies that you've set in place. Does the request routing, uh, maintains uh, authentication, and takes care of the authorizing, uh, puts in place other uh, specifics such as rate limiting, perhaps connection limiting, and of course, often overlooked but vitally important exception handling. So we're, we're going to talk a bit about management. We're, we're going to specifically talk about gateways uh, today. So what functionality do we need in an API gateway? I've selected eight of the principal ones I think carry the most weight. Uh, some would argue there's room for a few more boxes, but I would have needed a bigger screen, so I took these eight. Uh, you would want some form of TLS handling, TLS termination, TLS pass-through, TLS termination with re-encryption, whatever you need, uh, that needs to be in place. Uh, you'd want client authentication to make sure that the requests getting into your gateway is originating from a valid client. You'd like to have some level of fine-grained access control where you can ensure that uh, this request is in fact valid for this endpoint. Uh, if it's API to API communication, you want to validate that API A is in fact allowed to talk to API B before you allow that request to go through. You'd want request, request routing, uh, and at the very lim uh, basic level, you'd want routing based on URI. Uh, that's a must-have. Optimally, you'd want to see deeper-grained configuration about how your routing can be done in terms of uh, routing based on method, routing based on header content, router based on, routing based on body content for that matter. Uh, rate limiting, of course. Uh, you don't want to be overloading your, uh, your APIs. Load balancing, once you start scaling your APIs and or microservices, you want to have load balancing capabilities ensuring traffic gets distributed in an intelligent manner. Obviously, service discovery is vitally important, particularly when we start talking about orchestrated environments, the likes of Kubernetes, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, if you have any legacy concerns or uh, you, you need to do facade routing, perhaps, uh, you'd, you'd want to have the capability of doing some request and response manipul manipulation, uh, particularly in terms of headers and, in extreme cases, body. Uh, so you'd want that functionality in place. So we're going to talk a little bit about different deployment patterns, what fits here and what fits there. The first one that logically comes to mind is the edge gateway. Uh, for anybody that's ever deployed any form of load balancer, reverse proxy, anything of that sort, this pattern would look very, very familiar. And uh, when we're talking about what pattern fits for what kind of con uh, consumer or customer, if you will, uh, we often try to figure out in conjunction with them where they are on a, on a maturity index of sorts in their digital transformation journey. This is very often where people start. They start with an edge gateway that distributes traffic to the internal APIs. Uh, the edge gateway will take care of absolutely everything in terms of the a API uh, gateway functionality. It will function both as a security gateway as well as a routing gateway. So it will deal with everything from, from uh, beginning to end. And it will also take care of distributing traffic between multiple uh, replicas of a pod or a container or a service or a server. Uh, it'll essentially go through the laundry list of functionality. That's all well and good, but then we need to consider what happens if we start uh, utilizing what's commonly referred to as the strangler pattern. We need to add functionality or perhaps we want to, uh, to split up an API into microservices that are more tightly defined for the task they have at hand. We still want to present a unified uh, interface towards the client. 
And in order to do that, when you start having to route traffic to microservices that's either taking over parts of the functionality of an API or indeed extending the functionality of it, you need to introduce facade routing. Uh, the facade routing functions as a wrapper, so essentially even though API A now has extended functionality given through microservice E, the client still sees that as one API endpoint, and it has a robust and stable interface to talk to it through. Then you have scenarios where API A gets extended functionality through uh, microservice D. It can talk to it directly. It knows where it is. The configuration is set up in such a way that it can communicate directly. What's the challenge with this? Well, the challenge with this is we have absolutely no control over is API A indeed allowed to talk to microservice D? If so, at what rates is it allowed to do make requests, et cetera, et cetera. All of these policy enforcement, authentication, and authorization controls are gone. So how can we fix that problem? Well, we can introduce the two-tier gateway. The two-tier gateway allows us to uh, separate our concerns. So in the front of it, you'll have your security gateway, and you'll split out the, uh, the details for that into what it needs to do. It'll deal with the TLS termination, client authentication, it'll take care of logging, and perhaps it'll do some injection for tracing purposes as well, which becomes increasingly uh, important and popular. In the center of your APIs and microservices, you'll have a routing gateway that will take care of the other half of the responsibilities. It'll take care of the authorization, the service discovery, and the load balancing. By having this separation of concerns, you allow yourself a lot of flexibility in who is responsible for what. So our traditional NetOps team could very well move into this area, where our new DevOps teams will move into the other area. They get to control their own things, and this removes you out of the, uh, the service ticket hell that you often find yourselves in, where any change happening in your APIs or microservices requires an IT help desk ticket to get things fixed here. In this scenario, the security gateway is a relatively uh, stable entity. Uh, relatively is a redundant word. It is a stable entity. It doesn't change much because it doesn't need to know what's going on in terms of your API and ICE and microservices. That's the sole responsibility of the routing gateway, which will take, you know, take care of that through things like service discovery or, or other methods. So when API now needs to talk to API D, as in the previous example with the edge gateway, it'll do so through the routing gateway. The benefit you derive from that is now all of a sudden you can enforce policy on that request. You can enforce any policy you want, rate limiting, authentication, authorization, uh, and you can also enforce whatever kind of encryption you need to have in place for it as well. So that resolves a lot of the, the issues that we were seeing from the previous slide in, the, in that context. Now, let's have a look at the more DevOpsy style of things with micro gateways. So in the micro gateway side of things, you will still have your, uh, your perimeter gateway that will delegate traffic into micro gateways associated with a service. Uh, the, the micro gateways individually will take care of load balancing and, and proxy enforcement towards its specific service. And the benefit you get of that is you can have micro gateways individually owned by different DevOps teams. So the owner of a specific service has full control over what's going on with their service, how many replicas there are, if there's any alterations to, uh, to code, et cetera, et cetera. And the authentication and access control is taken care of at the micro gateway tier rather than hard coded into the application. So the application itself becomes a lot more stable in that context. Uh, the perimeter gateway still takes care of the security side of things uh, from an entry perspective, from an ingress perspective, I should say. Uh, whereas the micro gateway in turn takes care of all of the fine grained nitty gritty details. Then of course, we start seeing traffic east-west. Uh, so microservice E needs to talk to microservice F, and it can do so through the micro gateway of microservice F, or if, it's, uh, or if the network allows and the configuration allows, it can talk directly. 
Of course, if it's talking directly microservice E to microservice F, we're back to the previous slide where we're not enforcing any control over how they talk to each other. And that brings us neatly into the conversation about east-west traffic. So, in terms of east-west traffic, uh, in that scenario, we do have reasonable control over how microservice E talks to microservice F. We do so through service discovery integration, and we can look at uh, authentication and authorization control at the outgoing tier. The micro gateway takes care of everything else. But if you want any more fine-grained control over that, that's where we get into the sidecar gateway scenario. Sidecar gateways is essentially where there's a one-to-one -one relationship between the service and the gateway. Uh, you can consider them as members of the same container or the, indeed the same pod if you're in a Kubernetes environment. Uh, each and every service will only ever talk to localhost within its own container or pod, and the, uh, the sidecar gateway will then take care of everything with that communication towards whatever service or anything else it needs to talk to. So the communication would look like that. Now, that's all very neat and, uh, and tidy, and you get very, uh, very good control over what's going on and the security and rates and all of this good stuff. The problem is we have three services F here. So we're actually ending up in a scenario where the gateway gets an additional responsibility. The gateway now also has to take care of outbound load, load balancing. And that becomes a bit of a challenge because load balancing, the way we understand it, is optimized to function in a sense where there's a centralized load balancer, or indeed cluster of load balancers, that's ultimately aware of everything that's going on in the network. Because imagine the scenario here where service A, B, C, and D, and E are all trying to communicate with service F. How are these individual services, uh, sidecar proxy, going to know not to send all of the requests to the first instance of service F. It's very complicated stuff because of the extra, uh, extra steps and extra uh, responsibilities we put on the gateway. So the outbound load balancing is one element. Authorization is another. Where do you store the information about is service E in fact allowed to talk to service F? How do you ensure that that policy is applied equally in the configuration for each and every sidecar. Well, that's usually when this comes into play. So a service mesh is essentially the governing uh, control plane that will take care of all of your sidecar car proxies and ensure that they're all configured in a unison and coherent way. Uh, it'll take care of all of the policies being applied in the correct way on all, uh, in all aspects. It'll take care of who gets to do what and where. And in this scenario, all DevOps teams will share access to one and the same control plane, but the control plane hopefully will use some form of role space access control to ensure that I cannot mess up my colleague service over in his team. This is a massively complex uh, element, not least of which because of the two elements we highlighted, the outbound load balancing and the authorization. So uh, it's our stance that service mesh right now is still to be considered somewhat experimental or temperamental, if that's your preferred word. So how do we solve that then? Well, that brings us neatly back to this fella. Uh, with a two-tier gateway, we get uh, access to most of the features of the service plane with a central hub in between your APIs and services. So every request will go through all, uh, one and the same central hub, uh, reducing hop count and uh, other good things in the process. But, you may ask, and I'm glad you did, <laughs> isn't that a bottleneck? Well, it kind of looks like it on the diagram. But what if we consider that, let's say we have a thousand APIs and microservices, not an unreasonable number at all. We have 10 replicas on average of our microservices, bringing us to a total of 10,000 microservices, potentially communicating with 10,000 other microservices. That's a lot of traffic. Surely that must be a bottleneck. Well, what if we think of it like this? 
What if we think of our APIs in terms of communicating with other APIs in our organization as external clients? Is 10,000 external clients talking to 10,000 services a problem? Well, if it is, it's a problem Nginx solved 15 years ago on 15-year-old hardware, so I'll leave it to you. Uh, so in terms of the deployment pattern options that we've, uh, we've discussed, we have this four-way uh, split. So you have the Edge Gateway, which is an incredibly cheap way to get into API gateways and microservices reference architectures. Uh, it's very, very simple because it can coexist so easily with monolithic applications and so on and so forth. But it's not very happy about frequent changes because you're still going to be stuck in that uh, IT help desk ticket nightmare. And it is considered a DevOps anti-pattern. The two-tier gateway allows you a lot more flexibility and allows you individual scaling of functions. So the security gateway and the uh, routing gateway or routing gateways indeed can scale independently depending on what requires more attention. Uh, it does make it slightly difficult to delegate, delegate control to multiple teams. The micro gateway approach uh, makes it easier to delegate control to multiple teams so it's DevOps friendly. And it really, really suits high-frequency updates and scenarios. So even if you don't want to put a micro-gateway into production, maybe you won't, uh, it's a very, very commonly deployed scenario in development. Um, consistency is hard to achieve because we, again, can't share configurations between these different micro-gateways. And uh, there's no central security control. Finally, we have the sidecar gateway. Uh, which solves a lot of these problems, at least in promise, but it introduces a massive amount of complexity. Uh, and it's also quite expensive, both in terms of dollars and cents and also learning curve. Uh, so until that becomes a little bit easier, uh, it does add a lot of complexity on the control plane. Uh, with that, I'd like to open it up for questions. Yeah. Any, uh any questions out there? Different kinds of gateways? We could no. perhaps discuss the difference between API gateways and IPA gateways. <laughs> <laughs> no questions? Well, we're at the booth today and tomorrow, so if there's any questions uh, burning coming up, feel free to pop by and say hi, and uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Great. Yeah. Big round of a hand for Leaf. Thank you so All much. Right.